All right, welcome to the March 24th Arborist Call. We have a, a pretty full schedule today, so we'll get going. Um, format or the agenda for Arborist Calls is typically always the same. We have a quick you know, intro, we do some note updates from ZebraD, Zcash D, and then we have kind of an open discussion section. Um, we've been talking about NU5 quite a bit over the past few months. Um, we've got uh, continued discussion on that. We'll be talking about uh, obviously development status, timeline update that we uh, put out yesterday. And then we wanted to chat about testnet activation timing. Uh, I don't know if Strad had time to get to it before the call, but we were, he was gonna do a little bit of calculus on uh, potential block height that roughly correlates to um, April, April 6, roughly. But, but anyway, we'll chat about that in a moment. And then we have Mark from EQ Labs that wanted to uh, kind of have a, they're the group that did uh, Ziggurat. Um, and uh, the testing framework, and we're going to have a follow-up discussion on that. And then Daniel, um, I mean, we can obviously slot you in there for like a quick update too, if you wanted to, to just provide an update or whatever. Um, didn't know if y'all were going to make it this morning, but we, we always have a good bit of flexibility during that open period. So we'll get going with that. Um, Arbor's calls, for those that may not know, is we uh, talk about protocol and everything protocol development related. R&D, uh, design, implementation, blockers, et cetera. Of course, again, within U5, we're talking about the final stages and timing primarily and progress that we're making toward that goal. Um, the purpose is to make it more accessible. So, I mean, this is, you know, Nate, it, the Arbor's Calls, by the way, is Nate's brainchild. He thought it would be great to have like a, a protocol specific call um, for folks. And, and the goal was to make it more accessible and transparent to the community. So, you know, just, Kind of kudos to Nate because right now on this call we've got ECC, the foundation, Mark from Ziggurat, Daniel from Kedit. So we've got multiple groups involved in protocol and protocol related things. So it's exactly what we always envision the calls being. So kudos, kudos to Nate on, on the thought and idea. Um, anybody can participate. Uh, you just want to hang out and listen about protocol development. You're welcome to do that. If there's something you want to present, just uh, you can get in touch with me, Stephen at electriccoin.co. Um, or join our Zcash R&D Discord um, that's shared with the community uh, foundation. Everybody's in there just chatting about protocol dev. Um, let me know there. And it could be something you want to talk about, or you could just request that we discuss it and get it slotted into a future meeting. Um, okay, with that, I will turn it over to the foundation team for an update on Zebra D. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so basically, uh, what's going on with Zebra? Um, we recently have been working on on supporting to making Zebra work as a backend for the light to all of the um, demos. So, based to do that, we are implementing a bunch of RPC calls uh, which Light to the uses and Zcash the uh, support. So basically we, we're supporting those same RPCs so you can just, you know, uh, put Zebra behind the light wallet D and, and everything should work. Uh, so on the last two weeks, we implemented some RPC calls which were get best block hash, get raw mempool and get raw transaction. So basically, obtain information uh, about the blockchain transactions. Uh, so that's going well. Uh, we had to to change a little bit our database. Uh, there are two parts of that. One that was completed is that we are now storing uh, node commitments trees for all block heights. Before that, we just stored them for the tip, uh, except route, which also need for every block. Uh, but we need that because you know, light wallet D, uh, the, the wallets expected to, to be able to get uh, the document tree for any block. So we had just changed a little bit our database to store them. Um, and also the second part of that, which is what we are working on is a transaction index, which we didn't have before. We just stored the blocks in the database. Uh, so if you want a specific transaction, you need to get the block, parse it, and get the transaction out, which will be too slow. So we've been working on the transaction index. Um, and other than that, we fixed a um, kind of annoying bug in Zebra, which, you know, when Zebra was syncing in 
It was almost at the tip. It would get very slow and take a long time to re actually reach the tip. So we fixed that. Hopefully, uh, we recently uh, found a, a similar behavior, but it seems it's caused by another issue, but still investigating. Uh, so that's that for the light quality work. And the other chunk of work is, you know, actually getting uh, a release of Zebra uh, for the testnet reactivation, which basically entails updating our, our shared dependencies. You know, we use crates from, from SCC, like Libra as a cache, as a cache itself, Arch or Halo 2. Uh, so, so I've been working on updating those and just give an update, I just, you know, managed to compile everything, you know, fix it. There, there, was, there were some API changes, so I fixed it, uh, which was required. Zebra is compiling with the new dependencies. So the only thing is left is, nice. you know, making the tests pass, uh, but probably, you know, these are related to test vectors that have been updated and stuff like that, that should hopefully be simple to, to fix. Uh, so yeah, I think it's going well. It's going much faster than we expected. Good, excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry, another okay. thing. Uh, so uh, our goal is to, you know, to have a testnet, uh, a release of Zebra ready for testnet reactivation, but that will probably become also our first stable release candidate, uh, which will which is what we want to send for auditors for to, to audit Zebra. We are still right. looking for, for a company to, to do the Zebra audit. Hmm. That's it. Cool, very good. So uh, the the dependent, you know, we were discussing in, in the R&D uh, Discord in Node Dev, the dependency, that was the dependency update part is the kind that was challenging, most challenging last time, right, Conrado? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, and, the, the, and that's, the, that's I think the, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that's what you were talking about to go in kind of better than expected this time. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Last time, the uh, Zcash script, you know, uh, we had some problems with it, but now I already updated it, it's already working. And also, all the all the other dependencies are compiled. We, we, we are compiling with them, so I just need to need, fix the tests. Cool. Very good. All right. Well, that's excellent news. Yeah. Um, all right. Very good. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that update. Um, moving on to Zcashd. Our Zcashd updates are all about NU5. So we'll actually kind of hop ahead to uh, NU5 <laughs> and talk about that. Um, I include these always and everybody that's on the call repetitively. It's like, oh my gosh, not again. But for people that might pop into a random Arborist call and haven't seen the sequence, these are the new uh, NU5 zips. And um, these are the updated zips to reflect information, you know, relative to Orchard, for example. Um, everything is at zips.z.cache, uh, so you can go there, see any of these. Actually, the, that page has this summary as well. Um, so you're welcome to take a look at any of these zips or refer to those if you have questions about what some of this might be. Um, uh, I, I guess there will also be zip 315, which uh, wasn't in those lists. And uh, that's the one that, um, describes uh, cross pool transfers and um, the recommended um, practice. Okay. All right, I'll update, update my list for that then. Um, okay, uh, timeline, we put out a, a updated timeline yesterday. Um, as we discussed on the last Arbor's call, we hit a consensus bug in testnet, which caused a, I don't know if you call it a fork. It's more like a splintering or a fracturing. I think there's a bunch of different chains out there. The <laughs> multiverse. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's like, pick your own chain and find someone on it and connect I, with them and just go do your own thing. Um, I, I like fracture for them. Yeah, fra fracture, it implies pain in a way. So. I love multiverse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> multiverse is good too. How about a fractured multiverse? We'll go with that. We'll just, yeah. yeah. The, the painful multiverse. But anyway, we are roughly right here on the red dot. Um, it's kind of current time. We are working feverishly to get release 470 out on the Zcash D side, I should say. Um, and that will, as we were just discussing with uh, Conrado, um, have the 
reactivation height for testnet. Um, 470 release for us is super significant. Well, one, it fixes, we'll, we'll address the, the problem on testnet, but two, it gets the you know kind of final functionality for NU5 in place, um, primarily around unified addresses in the Zcash D wallet, RPCs, you know, et cetera, um, the ones that we had left. So looking forward to having that out there. Team's doing uh, doing a really good job on that. Roughly testnet reactivation, we'll chat about that in a moment, sometime around April 6th. Um, next milestone for us after 470, approximately a month away will be release 500, which is the release that would set mainnet activation height for, for any five. Um, between 470 and 500, we've got you know dot cleanup, help text cleanup, those kind of things. We've identified a few more repackaging items, uh, restructuring items that we'll do. Um, the big things in there are uh, completion of the security proof, which uh, Sean, Dara, Strad team's working on with Mary Mahler. That's progressing uh, very well. We don't anticipate any kind of um, any kind of problem with that. And then the the team has always had, as I've mentioned on this call quite a few times, um, the team wants to do another internal you know, let's call it uh, assessment of the the circuit, the orchard circuit, and also the consensus rule implementations. Just go back through, we've got a pretty pretty nice uh, checklist we've created to kind of go down and, and things that we want to look at, double check and make sure that, um, make sure everyone's happy with the, the implementation. So we'll do, be doing that between 470, 500. Um, we elected to move the, a 510 release out uh, after activation with our normal six week cadence kind of pace. Um, there was really not much advantage to trying to rush a 510 in between 500 and the actual activation time. Um, as we announced in our post, we'll target, you know, obviously when you set the main net activation height, you're, you're, you're picking a specific date for the most part within, you know, within an hour or two. Um, but somewhere in, you know, we put it, you know, mid to late March, or sorry, mid to late May. So that's kind of the, the current current timeline. Um, so yeah, if, if, if for the sake of argument, if for the sake of argument, there was a problem in uh, 500 that we needed to mm. fix before release, that, that would be a 501 point release. Right, yep. So anything, and, and ditto for in here, you know, we put out 470 if there's something for like, you know, Good grief! We forgot something, or we encountered like a problem, and we'd have four seven zero dash one or something like that, or four seven one. So anyway, yeah, but that's that's kind of the the current plan. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our update. So the the next thing to talk about, and I'm actually going to stop uh, sharing the screen, is the kind of testnet reactivation. So uh, unless someone has any questions about this, I'll just stop sharing so we can uh, all see each other a little bit better. And we'll kind of talk to test that activation, uh, reactivation timeline for a moment. So, Strad, did you were you able to kind of come up with a potential block height? Yeah. Um, okay. So looked at the current status of testnet. So um, we've already started um, running testnet nodes on the NU5 consensus branch, and in doing so, uh, discovered a little group of three servers that have been just quietly mining away on four zero zero. Um, and, and were never upgraded to the first NU5 activation. So yeah, there's like a chain of like, it's like mm. 300,000 blocks long um, beyond where the rollback would mm. go to. It's just like, you know, tidying away there, lots of, lots of proof of work on it. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the chain that we're, um, that we're back onto, uh, which is interestingly the, the first, um, it, it's been good. It was actually useful to see that it existed because that was one of the things we, we built into Overwinter was if you don't want to upgrade, you carry on just fine. And yes, they have carried on just fine. Hmm. Um, so yep, the, that works. Um, yep. So um, so that's all running now. Um, it was originally at about nine sol per second um, when I first found it. I probably one of those three was running a miner, and that's why they um, they kept going. Um, we've now booted up some of our own miners on that. Um, so, you know, yesterday, so it's now up to about 70 sol a second or so when I last booked. Um, so um, the, obviously the block interval over the last two days, if you look at that has dropped down, but over the last half a day or so, it's been pretty stable at about 73, sec 74 seconds a, a block or so. 
Um, so what, what we'd expect for that. So with that in mind, um, uh, looking at, um, I just picked like, you know, midday UTC um, on April 6th as a, as a target, and I get about 1821300 or so as a block height. Um, so that being like, you know, something like, uh, what is it? Um, 12 days, 18 hours from now uh, would be what that would be targeting. Is that um, 180,000 or is, uh, can you say that? 1,821,300. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. W within 50, it was like two, six, two, 1, 8, three, yeah, 261. So 300 is fine. Um, or I can make it a nice round 500 if you wanted to like push it a few, you know, an hour or so later in the day. I like round numbers. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. If we were to go to like one eight two two thousand flat, um, that would put us like into Saturday technically. Although knowing knowing the past, it's probably going to speed up, so we'd probably still be on Friday. So I don't know if we wanted to. If I, I we mean, wanted to. But previously, I th I think we've had less um, uh, mining power on testnet when we set the activation height. So yeah. Um, whereas Maybe right now it looks like it's this time. Yeah, I'm hoping it will be closer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as no one goes and like, oh, I'm going to go check my stuff on testnet, sick and ASIC on there. <laughs> yep. then, then, then there's not much we can do um, mm -hmm. when you pull like a 90%, yeah, 95% uh, mining attack on, on the testnet. It's just like, that's, that's not what proof of work's designed for. Right. Um, so yeah, 1821300 seems like a reasonable thing. Feel free to check my math and yell at me later if I got it wrong. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that um, that seems good. So yeah, if you're um, yeah, when four seven zero comes out, um, basically anyone who is currently running a testnet node and upgrades Zcash D uh, will need to just do a reindex, and that's a uh, normally we would have an automatic rollback logic, but there's just a, a slight add due to the way that um, the canopy to NU five activation is changing how the hash block commitments field of the header is is interpreted. Uh, we've got various uh, checks in the header logic for it confirming that um, various consistency checks hold. And um, one of those is now failing because it's trying to apply the pre-NU5 cons consistency checks to what were NU5 blocks, but are now no longer NU5 blocks, uh, according to ZcashD. I, we... I was wondering whether we could detect whether we're on the wrong chain and force a re-index. Um, detecting from the wrong chain requires um, having a knowledge of what those old those wrong chain parameters are, which means on a case by case no, it, basis, it, making any change. Well, chain. well, I was thinking it it would just say um, if the block at height um, uh, uh, original fork point plus one um, is not the one on the chain that we want. Then. That that requires baking in the existence of the old uh, fork, and I don't, I don't trust myself to get it right in a way that won't affect okay. mainnet. Right. Uh, and, uh, I guess you could do okay. gating. My point is, yeah. it's fixable, but with a reindex. I don't see yeah. the harm in just telling people oh, just right. yeah. reindex. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. It's it's a little That's bit. Of, it's well. a little bit annoying in this case. It'd be nice if the, the rewind mechanism could handle it, but. I don't see the, it, it's like an hour to, to and the, the other, yeah. the other thing, the other reason why um, I was thinking we, we might want to detect it is to clear the ban list in that case, um, because um, nodes will have, if they've been on the wrong chain, they will have persisted uh, ban information, which is now incorrect. Yeah, the, but that's also addressable with existing RPC tooling. Um, there's there's yes, other methods to yeah, adjust yeah, yeah. to call. alter the banning, and worst comes to worst, you can delete the ban list dot bat file. It's testing, like yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not particularly concerned about that. We can okay. we can mention in the in the release notes how to how to handle that. Mm. Cool. All right, so everyone double check the math if you'd like, um, but that should be roughly April six, assuming the uh, hash rate stays roughly the same on testnet. All right. Any questions about any of that before we move on? I have a guesstimate of how many miners are operating on testnet right now. And therefore, uh, if we add another of 
different capacity, it would significantly or less significantly swing the mining power? Um, I can ping DevSecOps and see how many they spun up because I know it went from roughly nine, which I was like, that seems like a single CPU miner uh -huh. um, on a decent CPU. Uh, could, be two, could be two maybe, up to however many decent mining um, things were set up by DevSecOps. I, I think there was only about four that they added, but like, you know, they're decent cloud compute mm -hmm. servers, you know, that, that we spin up specifically for doing testnet mining. So okay. um, I would pick there's probably about five or six miners on there at the moment, but yeah. Or, yeah, well, roughly, um, again, I have, yeah, haven't mm -hmm. verified today, but if it was 70 before, then roughly like, um, roughly like 85% of the mining power is ECC at the moment okay. uh, on that train. All so right. yeah, if you, if you are to, if you're going to spin one storm up for this, do so today. So we have a chance to um, uh, ver you know, verify that it stabilizes over the course of today and we can you know, see if we need to readjust the, um, uh, readjust the height uh, tomorrow before we pin it down. Great, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to know because I know that we have run at least one miner in the past and yeah. it has caused things to tip over <laughs> into one direction or another. We're like, oh, Test that is very small. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is very small. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. It's only like nine orders of magnitude or something smaller than uh, than mainnet. Wow. It's a lot of orders of magnitude. Yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of decimal shifting in there somewhere. Um, all right, very good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for that. Um, well, Mark, we can turn it over to you now if you're ready um, to talk sure. about uh, Kind of ziggurat and follow on from there and you're welcome to share your screen if you have something you want to share um or we can just chat whatever you'd like to do um i think we can just chat if that's okay okay yeah it works. Um, yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so for those of you who aren't familiar um equilibrium is a, a consultancy and a little bit of a venture studio um based in finland officially but we have developers all over i'm in the boston area and um, one of the things we specialize in is these sort of network, these low level network protocols. Um, we had a successful grant uh, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now um, to the Zcash Foundation for something called Ziggurat, which was a testing suite. Um, and we wrote probably 30, maybe three dozen tests um, and ran them against both Zcash D and Zebra and uh, found probably about a dozen between the two like security flaws that we just closed and then maybe twice as many like bugs in the, in the networking stack. Um, so we're looking to kind of continue that work. It was kind of a one-time thing and then we, we stopped and then obviously Zcash D and Zebra kept developing because as you do. Um, so we're just looking now to, we're going to submit another grant probably this week or next to continue the work. All right, cool. Dyer likes that. Um, and uh, extend on it as well. So we want to, we want to retest both nodes. We want to write new tests based on any changes that the network protocol has, um, you know, has seen. And then uh, what we're looking at beyond that is and this is where I'm, I'm hoping to get maybe some feedback on this or some ideas from this group is to create a network crawler that can look at the sort of overall health of the network based on ping, based on centrality and islands um, and just, just things like that. Get a, you know, right now the work was all focused on kind of a single isolated node in like a development environment. And we want to extend that through DevNet and test that out to mainnet and get a kind of larger sense of everything and uh, hopefully improve the health of the network through that type of testing. That's fantastic. I would love to see that. Cool. Um, uh, and yeah. this supports both Zebra and Zcash D, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's meant to be sort of node agnostic because the network right. protocol should okay. be compatible between the two. And that's another thing that we identify another, and test yeah i was gonna say that's something to to identify and point out right there yeah 
-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did some of that in the first, you know, so-called like phase one, you know, when we're talking about phase two. So, um, you know, I think it would entail updating the test suite, retesting both nodes. I know Zebra has, it's pretty time sensitive that we want to test that kind of ASAP because of the release candidate that's going out. Um, and then just based on the release ca- cadence of both nodes, put something in continuous integration in whatever you use, like GitHub Actions, just to make sure that when you make a new GitHub release, it automatically runs against it. Update uh, the test with each new release if the spec changes at all, or the, the protocol changes at all, and then build that crawler. So yeah, um, that's where we're at with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and, you know, questions, comments, suggestions at this point. Um, Zebra. Oh, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Can I go? Yeah, uh, you're a little bit quiet, Deirdre. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll talk directly into my microphone. How about that? Um, <laughs> uh, Zebra currently still has an issue where we don't show up in um, like block explorers. They don't recognize us or trust us for long enough and we have theories about why this is but we've never been able to like nail down why this is um i wonder if ziggurat will be able will the ziggurat project or the team in any of this work might be able to help us figure out why our external behavior uh is not uh what these block explorers expect for uh Mm. zcash or uh like bitcoin inheriting uh, cryptocurrency nodes to make, to let us show up. Um, because we think we're doing everything by the book, even though there is no book. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to, any, any help yeah. in informing any of that is, is a value to us. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Cause we, yeah, we understand that, that, um, Zcash basically kind of inherited the network stack from Bitcoin. Um, and, Ziggurat has sort of now become the sort of de facto spec for this because that's what we're testing all the stuff against, um, for better or worse. You know, we would prefer a, a, a formal spec, but we're happy to, you know, be tested against. I just found out about this problem, like literally as you said it. So I don't know if we're going to be able to fix it because uh, oh, I don't no, know the nature but... of it, but that's something that we can definitely like mention in the grant and look at because that uh, sounds important. Yeah, they should be showing up in the in the block explorers for sure. I think we have yeah. uh, spitballed some ideas about uh, putting out like an RFP of like we if someone has time and energy to go dig into this for us, which might involve like going to block explorers and either going into their code if it's available or talking them to them directly to ask how they figure out how they surface these things. Uh, that might be a thing that we do, but. The Ziggurat project's been so useful to us for like getting something codified about how at least the Zcash peer-to-peer network protocol is supposed to work, or at least the expectations of what the different the two different nodes now how they talk to each other. So it's very possible that you might find something in the scope of the, the grant that you've laid out uh, that informs us trying to solve our own problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'd really um, like to use some of this information to improve the documentation and to, um, uh, at the very least, to document how um, Zcash D is different from um, uh, Bitcoin in the, at the network layer. Strad, you had a hand up? Yeah. Um... I just wanted to ask if you uh, were planning on taking, uh, so it sounds like for the proposal that you're planning on putting up, you want to obviously do the retesting you mentioned, um, sort of in situ, but you're also looking at taking your live measurements from being a single node view of the network to trying to produce a wider view. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you're going to be taking into account like privacy aspects uh, around this. Um, I know with like Zcash at the moment is is like a a like global passive adversary is is something that we don't currently try to defend against. Um, but I'm also not particularly uh, yeah. happy. You know, I would prefer if we don't if we don't like produce one of those ourselves. I guess so. If um, <laughs> right. So if there's um, 
if, if you're planning on having considerations of like how that uh, information will be collected and um, and um, amalgamated. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. Um, we definitely don't want to dox anybody or anything like that, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, this is something we talked about internally. Like the last, last year when we discovered some of the security flaws, we were just like, how has, how has some, a hacker not used, not just in Zcash, but in any blockchain network, like how have they not used a network flaw to take down the whole network? Because a, a crawler with the knowledge of one of these things could easily just wipe the whole thing out. And um, I, I, I'm astonished that that hasn't happened. Um, it's only yeah. a matter of time, right? Yeah. 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 Like it's, yeah. yeah. It's important for us to find these things and identify them so that we can address them. Um, so, right, so like right. it, it's, it's just a case of finding the right balance I think, of what information is necessary to collect in order yes. to identify that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, the two, the reassurances I give you right now is yes, we want to be conscious of that as we develop this. And I think there's going to be a suite of tools that are for dev and testnet. And then a suite of tools that are for mainnet, and they're going to be kind of sub separate. So, like you know, you, you might be able to crawl mainnet, but like in a really limited way, and you can't do anything except just kind of look at it. Um, and then when you do look at it, maybe we don't publish IP addresses, or we don't, you know, whatever identifying thing is there. Yeah, because you want and to it's... know you want to know if the you know if the network is too centralized, or you want to know if there's like two yeah, it, islands or something like that but you don't need to know who it is or what it is exactly and that. it's yeah. And, and yeah it's just it's it's a case of i guess just being clear with you know what what is the what other metrics you're actually trying to collect because you know it's certainly there are, there are certain cases where like if we want to you know collect more persistent metrics um on a more ongoing basis then there's potential for looking into things like um, Previo or other um, collection techniques um, that use um, private aggregation, you know, um, uh, you know uh, MPC style aggregation to um, prevent you know, individually identifying information at the source nodes from being uh, identifiable in the in the top level set. But that comes down to like what information it is that we're trying to collect and whether it's compatible with those approaches. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think this would be an ongoing discussion. You know, we'll, yeah. we, our plan is to join the the R and D Discord and be pretty active in there as we yeah. as we go through this stuff. And if something comes up and you're just like, whoa, 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 don't show that. You know, then we will we'll remove it from the crawler. That's fine. So yeah. Yeah. That's all for me, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, I, and, um, there was one question yeah. in chat. Yeah. Um, just said um you know, great to hear about the initiative will yeah. this work be a self-deployable system was the first question yeah i think um in terms of like a, a public any sort of ui or gui for this i think the main thing is going to be um ci integration so like um okay yeah like 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 the code cove tool or something like that where it spits out like a little html mm -hmm. thing that shows the results i think that would be the first okay. step Okay. And then from there, maybe there'll be like a little service or a website that you can go and, and look at with, with the privacy concerns that Strad mentioned. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. De Deirdre, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I was kind of uh, jumping off what Strad said, which is that uh, we've spitballed, at least on the Zebra side, have spitballed. We collect, well, we, we make available a lot of metrics and instrumentation uh, of when you are running your local Zebra node so that you can monitor it. Um, we have lots of Grafana graphs uh, in our repository that you can just load and just uh, uh, view what's going on um, from your nodes view of the network and how it's performing and all sorts of stuff. Um, but we do not uh, do any uh, collection of deployed Zebras uh, back by anyone who, who runs and, and builds a zebra back to us at the Zcash Foundation. Um, but we thought about something like Privio or privacy preserving enhanced metrics that would, if you wanted to, let you turn on uh, reporting back in a privacy preserving way uh, so that we could see how uh, zebras in the wild are performing uh, if they want to perform it. 
Um, it would be very cool if we could sort of, we definitely collaborate with ECC about like types of metrics, names of metrics already, uh, because we kind of are in a similar place unless, unless on, if you are running your own node, you want to be able to compare the number that a zebra is spitting out and the number that a Zcash key is spitting out. Um, that would be very cool in general to uh, enable privacy preserving aggregate statistics for a general Zcash consensus node. Um, and that may help with uh, being able to observe the Zcash network in a privacy preserving way across yeah. nodes. Um, but that would be some work uh, to get that um, implemented and deployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, just want to clarify, you know, our, our interest is not, uh, ideally, we would not contribute to Zcash D or Zebra's code bases, right? Yeah. We would, this is like a black box external facing thing. Um, so that, those stats would certainly be, be helpful to like sort of compare against, like compare and contrast, but we would be sort of uh, not extra specting uh, the the nodes, I guess, if you if you say, like a black yeah. box test, more like that. Yeah. So the yeah the stuff that you're writing is um, so so you're not um, planning to be like using a Zcash D node or a Zebra D node as as a local view to the network. The plan is to only be introspecting via the network protocol. Correct. We have we have basically a already we have a. a mock yep. node that only understands the networking protocol it doesn't do yep. anything okay. else and we yep. use that um yeah. to do things i'm trying to think of there was one other piece but yeah yeah that's that's yeah. the idea St it, yeah it's still probably worth at least thinking in the direction deirdre was mentioning because yeah they um like the yeah i agree like you don't need to think about contributing stuff to zcash for, for oh, what you're yeah. looking at um but even like the metrics that we both exposed uh, can be um obtained in a black box way if it is just is a config yeah, that's right a Every, system um well, what so we it, do it, in, the, in the development context when we yeah. when we're just looking at a single node we have all the observability built in there we have the rpc and we can you know yeah. instrument the actual code itself and when we run the test we we do look at that stuff but in the yeah. main net context it should just be like yeah. rpc and the peer-to-peer -peer endpoint and that's kind of all we can see and hopefully people yeah. have their PC stuff turned off if yeah. they're not um, in Zcashd's case, the um like when you enable the metrics, you actually just end up with a Prometheus endpoint you can scrape. Um Perfect. same same yeah. as Zebra D. Um yeah. yeah, we we have like we've we've tried to lock ours down reasonably, but it does it doesn't have the kind of authentication the RPC one does because there's you know there's a limit to what you can really do when you're when you're like, oh, you're gonna put this on on the live IP, are you? Um, please, uh, please do, does it does it limit <laughs> it to um, listening on one two seven zero zero one? Yeah, it it's you, you that we have all that configuration built in. Okay. Like I upstreamed that to the to the metrics uh, libraries. Oh yes, I, I actually remember. The yeah, it's it's technically yeah. insufficient due to DNS rebinding attacks. Yeah, um, which can allow you to mirror into into local ranges. So technically, what you actually need to provide that full thing is is. Um, actual like authentication on the on the connection but like that's that's a rabbit hole we don't need to get into into this uh into this call um yeah well we we can keep talking in the r d discord about um about ways in which like general network stats can be potentially um you know pulled in some at some future point okay. all right appreciate thank that update, Mark. And sounds really yeah, yeah thank yeah. you sounds really exciting really exciting um, so, uh, Daniel, was there anything you wanted to share on uh, from Kedit's side? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know. Um, so we we actually released or shared yesterday in the for in the Discord a very initial draft of the transfer zip. Uh, we had a, a short discussion the, a couple of days before. I know that like most of the ECC team is super busy with the next release and stuff. So I, I don't really thank Sturger for sharing it. I, I guess I don't expect uh, have everybody having gone through it. Um, if we have like 10 minutes, maybe it's worth bringing up the discussion just because uh, oh, yeah. I think it's an interesting point around the design of the protocol itself. Um, I, I did skim through it just before the meeting. So I've got it. Okay, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Awesome. Do you, do you want me to maybe briefly um, kind of sure. review that design or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, we, we have time. Yeah. These calls are like an hour and 20 minutes. So we have, we right. have plenty of time, Daniel. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so basically, let me maybe just share my screen. That way we can all go with the same, uh, same flow. Sorry for um, these uh, runny nose with, uh, you know, some allergies going on here. It's going on here as well. It's the exact yeah, same thing. All yep. over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So you guys can see this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to maybe like introduce it also a bit as a comparison, like, but just to give maybe first the, the context, like the previous conversations we had kind of discussed mostly the, uh, the, the design that Dara uh, shared in one of the issues in GitHub. Uh, that, I feel, that I think also comes as an evolution of previous ideas and whatnot, um, which essentially said something like, um, uh, you know, we're going to change the base point of the value commitment to be uh, the to to be identified as 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 to identify different assets, but that base point is not really going to be the asset type itself. It's going to be some fixed value that there's going to be like a limit, let's say of you know L of these things. Um, and uh, these are going to be fixed also inside of the circuit, and that way you're going to be able to prove, um, you know, uh, the the that at the end of the day you have this the your the balance is with respect to the same value, even if diff, if same asset types have different bases. Um, now, when we started thinking about this. Uh, for me, like it, it became clear that there is a big advantage of having, you know, the base point be represented, like have the base point be the actual asset type. Um, and also in, in that it would reduce the potential, you know, size of the circuit and the complexity of the development, et cetera, because, you know, we're very aware of the difficulty of touching the circuit and we don't want to, the, the least we need to change, the better in some sense. Um, and what I realized, you know, I think it was like late last week was that this kind of small change of, of thinking in my mind kind of gave, gave me the, the, the picture of, of what the protocol could look like uh, with having, you know, the node commitment include the asset type and the value commitment also include that same asset type as the base point. And that's basically that we would have um, the type itself be a point on the curve uh, itself, right? So the context of this, right? The background is that um, the issuer, and we're writing this up now, but it's not ready. So, you know, we'll, we'll share that as well. But the issuer is basically going to generate some asset ID as a string, probably hashed based on their issuer key and, and, other, and other things, but it's going to be this unique string that's going to be public because issuance is going to be public. And then the chain itself is going to actually compute. So maybe, you know, the, in the issuance transaction itself, there will be the, the transformation of that, right, uh, asset ID at, into the group using the group hash. But this is a public transformation, so no need to compute it inside the circuit. Mm -hmm. And then this thing is going to be the kind of the real asset ID for the orchard based nodes. Right or the uh, I call it OSA by the way Orchard Shielded Assets because I thought that Zcash Shielded Assets is maybe too generic, um, and so in essence, what would happen is uh, you know and, and I'm sorry if there is some inconsistencies in the notation. Again, this is really very first draft. Any comments are welcome. Essentially, what we came up with is kind of having this note uh, structure that just includes the actual point of the type where you know, easily you include this in the node commitment. And then for the um, actually actual node uh, value, uh, value commitment, you're going to allow the, the value base point to be that same type. Got it. Right? Um, yeah. Now, regarding, so now the process of verification, right? Like, the issue that kind of came up with that came up is that right in the previous setting when you, you had one balance one value balance per asset 
you weren't revealing what asset it was because it's a fixed base point. Um, in this case, though, you would reveal the actual uh, value balance and the asset type because you need the value base point to hash the value balance of that specific asset type, right? Like I um, show uh, here. Sorry, Strad, you have a you want to make a point? Or? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well I, I do, but I'll wait. I'll wait till you finished the. Um, sure. Going through. Stephen, you want to? Um, I want to make sure I understood what you sure. just said, in 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 much higher level layman's terms. <laughs> this would so this transfer mechanism would reveal the asset type. So you would know it's a, a ZEC or a ZBTC or whatever, for example. No, so, so, um, I, I think I think that Daniel is halfway through his explanation, uh, and yeah, we should wait yeah, yeah. for the end. Okay, okay, um, all right. This uh, is a this is a problem that he's he's going to fix. Um, okay, yeah. hopefully, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, okay. Essentially, right. I, I like to present the challenges as I go ah, to shape okay. they, why was what's the rationale of what I'm doing ah, to okay, kind of okay. solve the So sorry, so, so sorry. C carry on. Yeah. No problem. No problem. No problem. So basically the point here is, is the following, right? Like thinking about when do we need this value balance is important because for Zcash, it comes in because of the fact that we have several pools. Specifically, one of them is, uh, well, actually for, for all the pools, but because of one of them is transparent and you have the fee, you don't care having a transparent value balance, right? Um, when it comes to custom assets or shielded assets, Except in very specific situations like issuance, burn, or turnstiles, we're not really thinking about allowing unshielding of these assets. So what this means is that the custom assets are going to stay strictly within that pool, which means that the value balance of that asset is going to be zero because there is nothing going in and out, which means that we don't need to add that value balance um, given that it's zero and, and you know, it's not going to be used in the commitment and the commitment is going to be zero anyway. You don't need uh, that value. So what we're saying, and maybe this is going to change, <coughs> but this first iteration is saying that we're going to have a vector of value balances. The first one's always going to be the ZEC one, and that's always going to be there. So the, the vector must be of size one or larger. But then based on whether the, there is some kind of unshielding or not, which again, the consensus rule is something that we didn't specifically add here yet, because I think this should come as a discussion of what we want as a community to see in the consensus rules. Um, but uh, essentially it could be added or it could not, right? And if it's not, then you're not revealing anything. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the BSK, the signature key uh, for the binding signature is still the same. It's all the randomness of every uh, value commitment. So per every action, basically. Here I distinguish also in the, name, in the number of assets, uh, but again, you know, it's maybe too, too detailed, too mathematical. Maybe I can just have uh, M, large M be the number of actions or something. Um, and uh, BVK is basically computed in the same way. Again, like, you know, having all the sum of summation over the CVIs and uh, re removing the value balance of the ZEC and then removing all the value balances for those that are non-zero, mm -hmm. right? This gives you the same BVK and the signature verification happens uh, exactly the, the same way. Um, the nice part is that you know, again, this is only going to be balanced, you know, based on the specific asset types because of the base point is different. <clears throat> and in the circuit, um, there is two more things that I, that I want to share before I, I, you know, open it for, for comments. And I hope you don't destroy this in two comments, but uh, <laughs> um, I see Strata and Dara preparing to answer. So... <laughs> Um, basically inside of the circuit, the, the most important part here is that you're using the type um, as a group element as an auxiliary input. And this is a single auxiliary input per asset type, right? In the action, you don't have more, like the, the, the action is per type, right? It's defined per type. And, and so this type is going to be used for the old node commitment, 
because this is a point of reference, right? Like, uh, and sorry for the redundancy, the, the, the old commitment is already on, on the Merkle tree. So you know that, you know, this is exactly the input that it has to be. And then you're going to reuse this in the new node commitment that ensures that the output asset is the same as the spent asset or the spent node and the output node. And you're going to use it inside of the CV as the base point. So we're basically going to have to change from a fixed base point to a kind of variable based on the auxiliary input uh, base point. And um, you know, the only, the only kind of uh, non-trivial thing in my mind, at least, you know, of course everything's non-trivial, but like the really non-trivial part was like, whenever I'm sending a note, uh, I'm spending a note, there is sort of probably most likely going to be two actions associated to that spent. And in the second action, sure, I can put any random asset as a, as a random base point, because I'm doing a, a dummy spend on the second action, but then the value balance is not going to work. You're not going to be able to balance that out. Um, especially if we don't allow the value balance to be non-zero as part of the consensus. Okay, that's all that I have to say for now. So, so um, um, there I'm confused. Uh, yeah, let's yeah, let's try to go. Please have some. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> So um, I do have two comments. Uh, you were correct on that point. Um, the first one is this, other than it being migrated to Orchard, this looks um, almost identical, I think, to the proposal that I made in 2019. Um, it would be helpful to, to look at that. Um, I've just linked the zip in um, the PR in chat. Um, at, at a scan, it looks like it's got very um, similar ideas there. So it'd be useful to just check against the two and check if the, so we can make sure if there's any uh, specific differences and differences in rationale, we can check those. And secondly, the document I wrote in 2019 um, contains the security consideration that I had around the concern I had around using the um, type as a base point, um, which I couldn't remember yesterday, the other day when I mentioned it there, but basically it allows counterfeiting. Um, so that the problem that. here, it, al it allows you to counterfeit funds. So the problem here is that if what is witnessed in the note commitment is a generator, is, is a base field point, um, then the prover can witness whatever they want, including a multiple of a known fixed generator. So the, the, uh -huh. the attack here is that you, you witness a, a known multiple such that it causes a overflow in the, um, in the field arithmetic. And that allows you to um, basically transmute funds from one, um, like a node multiple base point into a, another node multiple that is sort of out of bounds and, and causes an integer overflow in the field arithmetic. And then uh, you in a subsequent transaction can then overflow them back um, and end up generating legitimate funds um, that are counterfeit in the, so, in the so known fixed asset base. In, in so the so I, I thought this was the case as well. Um, it isn't because um, you are checking outside the circuit that the uh, when you're issuing um, uh, funds in a new token that um, you have correctly hashed the token ID to um, that doesn't work for dummy. For, um, I don't know if that works for dummy inputs. Um, is the thing the like the concern in, in the original proposal from 2019 that that was why we didn't go for a, a base field type so this is why i want to make sure that we've carefully checked the differences between this proposal and the one from 2019 to make sure Understood. that um that this this yeah. isn't a possibility yeah. Do, dummy yeah. notes are the critical point because it, you're right you can't allow um the prover to um witness an arbitrary base for a dummy um, note. Um, yeah. You you can allow them um, to witness some fixed base for a dummy point. Um, in other words, um, mm. when the value is zero, just require the um, the base to be some fixed point that you know right. that has always also been um, uh, hashed curved, so you know it's independent of other bases. Yeah, so the, and so for dummy notes, 
we also do constrain that the value needs to be zero there, but I'm I'm still not like the so, so the, the value the fact the fact that using the point in this way means that um that technically the circuit doesn't constrain it in any way is is fundamentally where the issue comes from. And so what you end up having to rely on is the is the external constraints placed on it, namely mm -hmm. um, the 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 idea that you in theory can't get such a note in there. Like See, actually, no, this, this is actually, no, I think this might be a, a wider concern now that I think about it even further, because the... Wider for what we already have. So if, if we're relying on the fact that when you issue, you compute that um, asset uh, group hash outside the circuit and bind it, that means that um, notes that are created and attested to in the commitment pool have fixed uh, notes, uh, balances. But what we're relying on is then when you do the value balance and you're doing the value balancing here, what ensures that the balances work is that the is that the bases are independent. Mm. But there's nothing that constrains the output notes in this design to have the same uh, bases as the input notes. It, but they do. So, so you it, could um, pick a, a multiple like you know, say you you shield a you know ZBTC type, and you have that type as a spendable note, and then so you that, construct a transaction where the type base is a multiple of the Z, the fixed ZBTC no, no, base. And that that was going to be my question. So, as far as I understood the proposal, there was a requirement that the output um, yeah. notes have the same basis as the input notes. What I was slightly confused by was that. Um, is that true for just between the input and output notes of each action? Uh, yeah, because I don't see that, that was, in the that proposed was circuit block in, there. That was it, the stumbling block to, in um, it, Strad's... It, it, can, we fin yeah. can I finish, please? That was okay. the stumbling block in um, Strad's original proposal, because at mm. that point, we didn't have um, actions that have a single input and a single output. And so yeah. we couldn't constrain um, the output notes to have the same. Which by um, the way, base for, as the input. for just a small incision here for credits, uh, credit asset transfer, which was based on sapling, what we did was add a third proof mm. that equated the two node asset types and also did the balance. So we removed yep. the balance. But yep. The point being is that because everything is in, in the same proof now, you just need to make sure that it's the same input used. So, yeah, so, what so that, yeah, it's that the, action, a restriction. It's the action refactoring that um, that makes this simpler. Yeah, yeah. Because you and can so always the, arrange that the um, you're using the same asset in each action. It That's does put a it puts a constraint on the construction though in that. Um, it, it will force you to have more dummy inputs and outputs than other designs and therefore make transactions larger in general because I you won't that's... be able to um, uh, combine um, inputs and outputs in the same way. But yeah, the if, if, if we have the constraint, which isn't in the circuit statement section yet, but that, um, that the same type be used as for both the input and output side, I on the second and third bullet points there, have type P, constraint the type P on input and type P on output be the same type P. Um, you want me to add it as a specific constraint? There? Yeah, like, he, like it says now, as a single auxiliary input to the prover. Yeah, just making it clear that like, because I see type P and it goes, yeah, that's just the type of the input, type the output. It's not clear that the constraint right. should be that these are exactly the same. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think this works. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that it's actually a problem that uh, to have this constraint that the um, asset types are the same within an action. Um, for for Zeka only transactions, it won't matter to efficiency. Um, for Correct. Sort of complicated mixed transactions, it will matter a little bit, but um, I, I think actually it's fine in practice. Um, it's a sort of thing that you could simulate and figure out yeah. um, whether whether it's um, wh whether it is a problem. Um, I, I mean, it's 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 kind of optimizing slightly for second only transactions, but um, mm. that probably doesn't matter. I think. 
Yeah. I think what we're going to do uh, is uh, to start maybe potentially writing a small prototype implementation because we have uh, yeah. a bit of a larger team now. And, and uh, while sort of two people write the implementation, two others are going to work on the issuance. Because now we, what we did basically here is kind of delegate a little bit more complexity to the issuance mechanism. But I think we can allow it because the circuit is going to be smaller at issuance. So maybe we can add and maybe a, an extra group hash in the in the proof of the issuance or something like this without uh, overloading the size of the proof for issuance too much. I think, yeah. but you know, that's again, still to be checked. So. Well, I mean, I, you, you don't need to do a group hash in the circuit, as you said, um, you, because mm -hmm. issuance is public, um, it's not necessary. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I saw Deirdre's that, hand that up same, briefly the same earlier. Trans oh. Sorry, Stephen. Oh, um, no, I <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask a question that kind of got addressed about since actions now roll up a bunch of stuff to the top level, so you might be doing a bunch of ins and outs and you have one action for several things, um, that kind of makes the complexity a little bit trickier than if you were doing it in the sapling way where it's like there is a spend proof or an output proof for everything that you're doing in a transaction um and i was wondering how i i do not uh hand roll these circuits uh you know um so uh, just sort of that sort of thing like does that does it get really complicated to juggle or performance wise the fact that they're all rolled up now as opposed to just like one off you, you mean the proofs themselves yes because you aggregate the proofs. Yes. Again, I think this, uh, you know, the, the benefit of, of the design that they're uh, presented is that the proofs are going to be the same. And I think oh. with this one as well, because mm. the inputs, it's what changes. Okay. So oh, you're not going to yeah. have any issues yeah. with distinguishability or with like aggregation and stuff like that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I was wondering, um, I was wondering about um, metadata leakage in terms of the, um, the order of actions, but I think it's fine. Um, so, so basically the issue is that um, uh, you leak to the recipient of an output um, where it is in the transaction, um, but that's fine as long as you randomize the order of actions. And for example, I, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, it, it, may, it, it, it will make add, uh, the, what it, what it goes to the uh, encrypted uh, part of the transaction. I, I think there yeah. is a couple of things that need to be added there. Probably uh, the types and the positions and stuff. But uh, the transaction itself, like the public part of the transaction, uh, like what goes onto the blockchain and the action description itself as an action don't actually change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really right. That's, um, that's very useful. Yeah, um, yeah. it so it does make that are different to the issuance transactions. Yeah. yeah, it does make the um, it does make the process of building transactions a bit trickier, Dara, because like right now we can just we take all of the spends and all of the outputs, we pad the spends and outputs to the same number so that we we can line them up. Then we shuffle them independently and then you know, pair them off before we can create the actions. That right. becomes but tricky because we would then need to um, you would need to both. Um, you would need to pad, you would need to click them into sets based on type. You would need to pad each type group um, uh, to, to, a, to an even number of inputs and outputs. Yes. You would then need to shuffle those type groups independently. Then you would need to shuffle the type groups into each other. Like, you know, once you've paired them off to actions, you need to shuffle yeah. those actions again into each other. So it does you, make you the process. You don't need, okay, you don't need to, uh, you don't need two layers of shuffling. Um, you just uh, you, do what you what you said. You you pad um, each type group, and then you shuffle the whole thing. But that means that it doesn't it doesn't matter uh, whether the um, whether the uh, token mm, types are interspersed. Yeah, I guess because dummies aren't directly identifiable from the spins. Like my but concern basically fact, was if you, you could if you fact, can if tell you the, if you do it the way you did uh, said, then you leak a small amount of information to recipients. How so? Uh, were you suggesting that um, each token type would uh, would be in a particular block, and then you shuffle the blocks? No, no. I was okay. saying you, right. you have I'm to do the, you have to do them in blocks in order to pair them up for actions. That's what we do right now because you can't yes. you can't pair to actions and then shuffle. 
um, but in order to make sure that the that you don't leak that like this set of thing, yeah, so they're, they're not in blocks. You have to do the per type shuffling within the block, um, then pair them off into actions, and then pull those into a single group of actions that you can then shuffle before building them um, on their own. And the reason I was going to do that, oh, the yes, first yes, shuffle, you do, right. is that where the dummy where the dummies are paired aren't directly correlatable. Um, if if the locations of dummies happened to get removed, but that yeah, is because you, trickier you want to, to visualize, I guess. So you want to not leak to someone who um, has, say, a full viewing key uh, and therefore can recognize nullifiers. You don't want to leak to them which um, output um, corresponds to that, except in, insofar as it's the same token type, which doesn't give them any additional information. Full viewing key doesn't matter there because full viewing key gives you outgoing viewing capability. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, it's, yeah, it, yeah that, that actually simplifies things. Uh, yeah, we, well, it we need to... the security analysis, not it, it It makes building the transactions trickier, yeah. but it does I, I um, simplify um, the stack. And yeah, yeah. Daniel, I realized yeah. why I missed that initially. It was a There was a note in overview and rationale that said they'd be the same, but I'd skipped over that because I was looking at the at the spec to try and upscore that, and the spec missed the um, the constraint. Sure, so, sure. so yeah, uh, yeah. With, with that constraint in place, I think, yeah, you do get sufficient chaining effectively. Yeah, you're relying on the third third, third party, like the external, yeah. you're relying on the issuance to make sure that it's a valid point. Exactly. And then we preserve that chain yeah. throughout. So it, essentially um, the first transaction of the chain, which is going to be a transparent transaction mixed maybe with like a, a shielded wait, output. Should... I've just, having just said that, what happens when you split a uh, so let's say I I shield ZBTC. Yeah. I I then have a ZBTC note of 10, 10 Bitcoin, because you know I'm a I'm a nice whale and I want to shield my Zek. Um, and now I want to pay someone. Uh, I, I want to transfer some of that ZBTC to someone else. So I have to take a single ZBTC note and turn it into two ZBTC notes. That's going to require two actions. Now the one that is within, within the same action is going to be chained correctly because we constrain them to the same type. What happens with the second action? But that, that's what I was saying before, that um, you're not going to be able to balance it out correctly, even if you change the output node um, a, a base point, value base point. And what Dara was also saying earlier is that you can also add a constraint that says that even if v equals zero, you need to at least have some fixed um, value. The, 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 the problem that um, Strat is pointing out is not a soundness problem. It's a, it's a completeness problem because um, you do want to be able to split notes. Um, yeah, yeah, but you do, you do split them. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to think through. Um, I'm trying to think, is there a scenario where basically the value bits, it, could someone, um, could someone do this basically? Could someone, um, uh, we might, we might be okay, be, <laughs> we might be okay specifically because we chose actions to be one and one out, not two and two out. Mm. We might happen to be okay. So the, in, in that scenario, if you're doing that splitting, um, in this case of one to two, you need one of the input, one of the actions has a real BTC input and it's going to have a real BTC output that is smaller. So there is an, so there's a leftover amount of say five times the ZBTC base. Um, in, this, in the next action, you don't want to spend a real input because you're, you're trying to do a transmutation. You can't use a transmuted base on the input side because it doesn't exist in the in the commitment tree. So you have to use a dummy input which has zero value, which therefore can't contribute to the to the base. Um, what you could do is then use a but but that dummy input can have any any um, type. So you could set that to be the fake, but it needs to be able to have any type because if you're going to do the splitting, it has to be able to be the dummy value has to be of the same type as the output type. Now, if that dummy type were the, the, the like the synthetic two times the ZBC base, then that 
would be a that would be doable like you could synthesize that but you still have a leftover amount so so, so i see and, how to do it you, yeah. you basically have to uh uh what was what hmm. Actually, no yeah. I, I was think i was thinking you you could basically use the um uh, mm -hmm. a real note um on the input side of the the dummy um and then um which oh, would leak yeah, it, can, it, can, it can work. Yeah. So, so you you prove that um, some note with that token exists in the commitment tree, regardless of whether it's been spent. Um, and then because it um, no, but then because it has zero it value, add it up. But you're going to be adding it up to this to the commitment value. No, no, it, no, you, no. I, it, no, I see what you're going value, with this. Yeah, yeah. If it has zero value, uh, then the it doesn't matter that. Um, what it's no, but the bases, but you're, you're using the thing. but you're using the base to constrain the base of the output. So mm. you're you're proving effectively that the output base um, is some existing base in the um, yeah. The you're the you're frame. leveraging the yeah. the new constraint in the yeah. That that's okay, quite so clever. Wait. So wait wait I I see where this is going. I just don't see how it works completely because the point is so, that you you cannot add twice the same note yeah so what you do uh -huh. is wait, 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 wait. Yeah. you can you cannot add the no, the same note twice because it would be spending twice yeah and if you if you make the second uh, dummy input but now real input like, like sorry, the dummy real input a uh, uh, value zero then the commitment doesn't verify in the tree yes so oh, what you do moment, is you witness you both that. so so what we sorry, so the way that, we do this in the orchard circuit is by using the zero value if the if the note that you witness has zero value that zeroness turns off um, all of the other checks so what we do is we say a zero valued note we reveal a valid nullifier so we do a correct nullifier check but we turn off the path check this would be the inverse so yeah. you witness the yeah. real note but you say its value is actually should be considered zero and that turns off the nullifier check so you can witness whatever nullifier you want but turns on the path check but what stops anyone from not invalidating the path check or the value check like the, it's not enforced like so if you so if you if the value that is witnessed in the circuit for that note is um is non-zero so you, you would have to be able to witness both you would essentially instead of having this instead of using the zeroness of the that of the value uh by mark as the flag, flag you would have to witness a separate um exactly. this and is a dummy note flag. Now. um yeah but you would just witness it as a flag and so instead for the legacy approaches of like dummy values when the flag's enabled the value is constrained to be zero but the okay. question, the question is attack attack wise. If I wanna, you know, spend twice my note and I don't enable the dummy flag, then the nullify gets revealed and you see a double spend. And it's a double spend. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the nullify check is only turned off if that dummy flag is set, and like if the, the dummy double, flag is set, the then the value used for the value balance is zero. Right. The dub, the double spend check needs to be local in some sense as well, like. Checking. No, it doesn't need to be local because like here you would transaction. Like you can't spend the same note in the same transaction. Like, uh, can, well, can in this case, you sharing and, can you stop yeah. screen sharing? And I will show the change to the action circuit that's needed. Um, yeah. Okay. That's nice. I so, like yeah, it. Because, yeah, because uh, if this yeah. works, Brad and I have a, have arrived at exactly the same. Idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, because if this works, then basically it's relying on the same thing you're relying on, Daniel, which is. The issuance, the first issuance, and binding the transparent the the asset type, that yeah. is carried through both into when you spend the real note, and then when you try and spend create a new dummy one that has a dummy, because you essentially are required to witness that the the, the output notes asset type exists, yeah. and that's what the, that's what this gives you that authentication chain for, and that prevents the um, the counterfeiting. And basically, attack. we're basically now uh, shifting or creating a small subset of constraints or a proof that's saying. Proof of existence, yes. effectively of yes. Oh. But you can do that as like a as a minor modification to the existing rules. And that, but that's amazing. That opens up a whole set of possibilities and applications. Yes, so, yes, it I does. Like uh, yeah. Okay. Like so so to explain, um, in yes. case anyone wasn't yes, following, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I'm writing things down. I'm like, I think I yeah, know what's I, going I think, on. So, 
Um, Strad, um, Daniel and me understand it now, um, but let's explain it. Um, so currently, this Merkle path validity check mm. is, um, is gated on the old being um, non-zero. Mm -hmm. So for a dummy note, um, the old is zero, and we, we just don't do this. Um, Makes sense, because it doesn't exist. Check. Yeah. Okay. And then that value old is used in the value commitment integrity check. So essentially, the dummy value, like if you want to turn off the path and spend a note that doesn't exist, you're required for it to contribute nothing to the value commitment and therefore right. to the overall value balance. Okay. 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 So, so that, that works. Um, but uh, what we want to do in this case, we want to prove that um, a token is valid in the sense that um, its base is independent of other bases. Okay. Um, so to do that, we want to um, check that um, the base is the same as some existing note in the tree. Ah. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not it's a spent note. Um, so mm. instead of um, gating v uh, not equals uh, v old not equals zero here, um, we gate it here in nullifier integrity. Mm. Um, so this would become nullifier integrity either v old equals zero or um, this current condition. And what that allows you to do is um, for a dummy input note, um, uh, so, so, so suppose we have the scenario that we were talking about before where you, where you want to split some uh, ZBTC. Um, so your, your first um, action is um, uh, input note goes to- uh, Partial output note. Partial output. And your second um, action is dummy note, but um, you have to prove that it exists in the tree as mm -hmm. um, that there exists one ZBTC note in the tree, spent or unspent, um, to the second um, partial Z, uh, okay. yeah. uh, second so, ZBTC output. Yeah. So it wouldn't specifically here be either V or, e either v or equals zero or what it would actually be is either enable dummies, you know, either is dummy equals true or NFOLD. And then well, the well, actually, path actually, validity and let's call it let's call it, call it let's call it if you want to call it different. Let's call it yeah because because V old will still have to be the value because in order to do the Merkle path check there you need the the actual value of that note you're proving in the tree in order to derive its note commitment. And so V old here would still be a non-zero. Yeah. We still need that check for dummy of Zek. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually this field here that you need to be zero. Uh, yes, to, exactly. To, yeah. yeah. So, so what? Yeah. So you would be constraining that value to be different, and that check would be fine for existing dummy notes for Zek, um, as You're long right. as so this. This yeah. becomes basically yeah. what Generic. the thing that I've highlighted becomes: um, is dummy uh, use zero, otherwise use uh, the old. Yeah, so you could do this while keeping the existing v old equals zero condition on Merkle path validity, because essentially that condition continues to be fine. Um, and you would essentially put a, you could actually have the, um, uh, maybe the maybe is dummy is the wrong name for that Boolean flag. Mm. The Boolean flag might actually be um, uh, is, is OSA or whatever, OZ, OS, OSA, yeah. because that's really uh, is anyway. all it's used for. And that's, and that then, if that flag is false, like, or rather, if that flag is true, then V old must be non-zero. Yeah. And then uh, V old uh, V old of the note must be non-zero, which means the Merkle path validity check is enforced. Yes. But then the v, the value used in place of V old in value commitment integrity is then hard coded to zero with that Boolean flag. Yeah, and then the nullifier. Um, still, the and you still don't show the nullifier. Um. Yeah, exactly. Because well, you, you turn the you, nullifier you can check off. The nullifier in that case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You would. It would yeah. be. Yeah. When when the is OSA flag is set, the nullifier is unconstrained. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It is still required to be unique because the nullifier is revealed in the same way that dummy note nullifiers still are unique. Because and which is why they work. As long as, as you have a PRF, you should be fine. Kind of thing. Exactly. Because yeah. well, yeah, and we use them as the if if it fails, well, it will fail when you try to submit to the network, and so you'll be forced to to re-roll your nice. transaction, which is fine. Exactly, and yeah. we we rely on um, the uh, PRF output not um, colliding 
um, anyway for completeness. So that's it's yeah. no different to the existing protocol in that respect. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Okay, just just to quickly summarize, because I know maybe Stephen wants to take over to finalize the call. But just to <laughs> summarize the whole thing, the in theory right now it looks like the proposal uh, you know works mainly because of the fact that. Uh, kind of the differences between sampling and or and, and or chart that yeah. the two input in, input and output nodes are combined kind of solves this big uh, equating dilemma by ensuring that the type is the same in both uh, old and new node. Uh, and when it comes to splitting, then we have this new trick that is inverting the whole dummy node path, which is more generic for multiple assets, which is awesome. And there is an, a specific check and kind of potential complexity that needs to be handled at the issuer level. Um, that we yeah. need to make sure to uh, solve as well, and that's what we're going to be working on in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's, this sounds fantastic. Now, um, I love yeah. it, and, and I think this I think and I, I, I know that I said this kind of a, threw it out there, and it's not you know the right term, but it's it's a little bit more elegant. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, if exactly the the type just being a point is very elegant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It just yeah, the the first go at it three years ago was broken. And um, now we have now with the way which it is, it can be fixed, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I was, um, so this definitely works as a, a black box. I'm just thinking how it might interact with other potential features. I, I guess we don't have time to discuss it on this call. But, um, I, I need to think about how it interacts with things like um, uh, the. I had proposed a protocol for um, uh, based on election protocols for um, for um, doing uh, supply auditing. Um, so I need to check how it interacts with that. Um, All right. See, that's the only other thing that I can think of. Yeah. Everything else, be like. Yeah, the Everything the else. changes relative to the 2019 proposal are, are very minimal. So most of the analysis of what we'd already been doing relative to the 2019 proposal should still apply. Yeah. Um, it's it's mainly just yeah the the type being now a base field element and and constrained in this way, um, uh, just means that then yeah the all all of the things tied to what this asset is occur directly at issuance. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yes, amazing. Let's let's do the following. I'll I'll rewrite a little bit with more detail what we discussed, and uh, we'll hopefully have some you know test implementation or something uh, in the next month or so, and and you know together with the issuance draft. So let's I'm I'm putting in my mind a, a, a potential tentative goal next uh, arborist call at this time zone. Mm -hmm. We'll hopefully have the full picture to discuss Absolutely. at least like the first draft right. full picture. Uh, so small detail when you're writing this up. I think I would prefer if if V old stays as the um, the the value that is actually being used in Z, uh, CV net, and we use yeah. some other variable name for the um, for the, for the value spent of the old notes note. value. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Excellent discussion. Mm. We're 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 right. We're we're in our ten minute buffer, so we're arguably <laughs> right on time. So. <laughs> Um, no, phenomenal. So appreciate yeah. everyone uh, joining us today. Uh, good to see you, Dodger. Uh, and and anyone who's reading the uh, watching the <laughs> recording can see how protocol design works in real time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Which is so much fun. Just, uh, I'm so happy no, to be cool. part of the community in this way now. And mm -hmm. this is fun. This is fun. And by the way, can anyone tell? That Strat and Dara are tired of staring at C code related to NU5. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is it's catnip. like, no, 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 Stephen, we're, we're never getting off this call. You know? I, so anyway. I want to do some math. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Everyone have a, have a good rest of the day and thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah.